Are hot hatches really the best cars you can buy? Usually, a fun car requires an uncomfortable amount of sacrifices. For example, supercars can really only haul a tacky designer shirt and maybe some loafers. And having convenience in any way, shape, or form often means giving up any sort of fun or style you can have in a car. However, hot hatches are an exception to both rules. They offer the best of both worlds and are also usually more affordable than the average supercar or crossover. And in this video, I will explain some of the history of the hot hatch, break down why they're so great, and then discuss which ones are best. The car that started it all was the Volkswagen GTI. Released in 1975, the Mark 1 GTI was a revelation as far as sports cars go. It had performance that was on par with even some of the more anemic Ferraris of the day. And while it probably couldn't outrun a supercar on the drag strip, it sure could on a tight, twisty road. The GTI was not the first hot hatch by any means, but it was by far the best of its time, and it set the standard for pretty much every hot hatch to follow. The second superstar of the hot hatch world was the 1984 Peugeot 205 GTI. And while Peugeot may be known nowadays for building cars that are kind of the automotive equivalent of a Drake album, they were almost unstoppable in the 80s. The 205 GTI was one of the many iconic cars that they produced at the time, and really helped solidify the hot hatch as a genuine performance option for those growing tired of their rickety old Fiats and MGBs. Now those 100 odd horsepower front wheel drive cars are all good and dandy, but as the 80s progressed, there was a crop of even crazier hot hatches. These cars that were loosely based around boring commuters were homologated for Group B Rally. They were mostly all wheel drive and had a ton of power for the time. The best known of all of them was the Launch and Delta Integrale. And while it technically came after Group B, it was the hottest of the 80s hatchbacks. With 0 to 60 figures that rivaled the mighty Lamborghini Countach, the rally influence would continue in the 1990s with cars like the Subaru WRX, Ford Escort Cosworth, and Mitsubishi Evo. And while these cars lack an actual hatchback, they were pretty much the peak as far as throwing race car parts at small forgettable economy cars. And with that, we're at the present day, and we live in a world where the greatest of hot hatches have already gone. Cars like the Fiesta ST, Mark V GTI, and early Civic Type Rs. And the remaining ones are more expensive and have a lot of useless tech. <laughs> But now you're probably curious exactly why they're great. The reason hot hatches are so great is their versatility. No other car lets you move large objects like, oh, I don't know, rugs, while also being able to dump those rugs off at the cleaners and then go for a spirited drive. And I know some of the more uh, focused enthusiasts in my comment section are busy typing something that goes like, er, Mr. Fast, what if we live alone with no back patio and no gardening project? What if we want to go to the track or autocross? What then? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the great thing about a car that can store a whole ass rocking chair in the back is that it'll also gobble up spare wheels and tires for the track, and maybe even a jack if you're lucky. And the great thing about a hot hatch handling like a Miata, but having similar space in the back to a crossover, is that you won't have to say you drive either one and suffer the retributions <laughs> that come with Miata or crossover ownership. And as far as handling goes, hot hatches are among the best and most balanced cars you can buy. They would make a great beginner car for anyone that's willing to get into just about any type of motorsport, unless it's drifting. And that brings me to most people's biggest problem with hot hatches. Most hot hatches are front wheel drive, and some are all wheel drive, and as a result, reserved for those with richer tastes. Since there are really no rear wheel drive hot hatches, all the drift cans can't really be bothered with owning one. And that's understandable, but for anything that isn't competitive drifting, a hot hatch really is your best option. Even though they have some, shall we say, unique issues that come with the front wheel drive platform, it doesn't mean that you can't build or buy a great handling, reasonably powerful front wheel drive car. And if you really feel like you need it, you can always splurge and buy an all wheel drive hot hatch. Now, in the extremely unlikely circumstance that this video actually inspired someone to go out and buy a hot hatch, I do have a few recommendations. And as someone who drives the Volkswagen GTI around town every now and then, I sort of know what I'm talking about. With that being said, since I've barely had a driver's license for a year, I haven't actually driven any of the cars on this list. So it'll be more of a cars real fast wants to drive or own than a motor trend sort of situation. And with that, the first car that I want re <coughs> recommend uh, is of course the Toyota GR Corolla. Now again, I've never driven one. And despite the the fact that there are some, shall we say, questionable styling choices on it, the Corolla seems to be a pretty quick and well handling car. And again, I'm not really the biggest expert on this sort of thing, but as far as new hot hatches go, the one that seems to be the best is, of course, the Volkswagen GTI. I wouldn't buy a Mark 8. Too, too many goofy, like, digital interface screen thingies in there, you know? AI. I don't like that. But the Mark 7, the Mark 6, they're pretty good. And of course, the older ones are great. And I really don't think you 
can go wrong except for maybe the Mark 8. So now that you know a bit about these magical cars, I would like to hear what you think. And if you like this video, please consider tuning in next time and I'll see you then.